Well, hello, oh, readers. I am so excited to be here today, and I'm talking with my friend, Brittany Ann, and we're going to be talking about her book, Follow God's Will, which I'm reading and I'm loving. But first of all, just welcome, Brittany, and why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be able to chat with you today. Um, like you said, my name is Brittany Ann. I am the owner of equippinggodlywomen.com, where I challenge, encourage, and equip busy Christian women to go all in in their faith and family. Um, I have a new book coming out, which I'm sure we'll talk about, called Follow God's Will, Biblical Guidelines for Everyday Life. Um, and other than that, I am a wife and mom um, and all the normal day-to-day -day stuff that we all do, dishes and laundry and all the things. All the things in the middle of our day and writing books and inspiring, encouraging people. Um, do you have a copy of your book to hold up? Because I, I just do. have a Kindle, Kindle version. So I've got to show. I so I have the book. It is backwards, of course. Um, but it's follow, follow God's Will. And then there is also a companion workbook that goes along with it as well. So the book has all of the information. And then the workbook will take you through tons of like exercises and all of the things just so that you take everything that you're learning and you put it into action in your real life. So it's not just theory, um, but you're like, okay, how does this apply to me? Yeah. And I love that so much that it's very personal. And you say in the book, I'm not here to tell you these are the steps of God's will, <laughs> like this and this and this is for you, but really how to discover God's will. So I would just love like, where did the idea came from? And where's your, your heart for helping readers to really know and discover God's will. Yeah, well, it's kind of two things that worked together um, at the same time that ended up being this book. So one of them was that last year I had published a my previous book, which was called Fall in Love with God's Word, all right. on the topic of how do we, um, as busy Christian women, get into God's Word regularly? Because as we talked about a minute ago, we are all busy. We have dishes and laundry yeah. and all of the things, and we want to read the Bible but how in the world do we have time to do that? So I had done that last year. And then after that, I had spoken with my publisher and they said, okay, like this is great, but we feel like there needs to be a follow-up. So after you're reading God's word and after you are already in it, how do you live it out today? How do you take these Bible verses? Um, because we know that the Bible is full of so much yeah. wisdom and encouragement um, and there's so much there for us, but it's not always easy to understand. Okay, this verse that was written thousands of years ago, like how do I very practically speaking, apply this to my life today. So I was having these conversations with my publisher when they're saying, okay, let's talk about, you know, how do we walk this out? And um, definitely checked out your books. I know you have one of your older books was a walk it out as well. So I was definitely reading yeah. your book around this time as well. Um, but then I also was having so many conversations with people in real life and online where the same question kept coming up again and again and again of, okay, how do I know what God wants me to do, whether that's a big thing. Like, how do I know? Like, do, am I supposed to go back to work? Should I take this job or that job? Or how do I deal with my mother-in-law who's driving me crazy? Or how do I deal with my teenager's attitude? Or how do I deal with um, all of the social media debates that we see every time that we log online and we see so many people fighting about these issues and we work with people who believe differently than us. And it's just this question I keep seeing pop up again and again is how do we um, have these conversations? How do we stay strong in our Christian faith and what we believe while also loving our neighbors? And what does that look like? So like you said a minute ago, I don't have all the answers. I wish that I did. Um, I wish I could come here and tell you, oh, it's really easy. You know, just do this, do this. Um, but it's going to look really different for every person, every situation, every person is different. We all have different personalities and gifts. Um, so the purpose of this book is just to give women a biblical process or framework that they can go through themselves step by step and figure out, okay, this is what God's word says. Now let's figure out how this might apply to me and my life today, specifically where God has placed me in the relationships that I have, in the environment that I'm in, with the personality and the gifts and the strengths and the skills that I have. How do I live this out today? So that's kind of the long story of how that all came about. Yeah. And what I love when you talk about it is you talk about these expectations. And I know we have expectations for ourselves. I'm a firstborn uh, yeah. grandchild and child. Like I know, like these are all the expectations, like this is how things should be run. And even in the Bible, there's the Pharisees that had like these expectations. And we in well-meaning ways of want to do everything right, we often place burdens on ourselves and burdens on other people. So it really is deciphering like what is God telling us to do or what are just unrealistic 
expectations. So I'd love for you to share more about that. Cause I think when we grasp that some of these things are just our own expectations or the expectations mm -hmm. of maybe a Christian community that we feel so burdened by things that God hasn't clearly stated, like you definitely have to do things this way. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely been part of my story as well. So I grew up in a very small legalistic church. Um, and I won't throw the denomination under the bus because this could happen in any church. But this exactly church, it's it's not about which one it was, but it, um in any church, there are churches, there are people, there are pockets here and there um of people who are very well meaning, who really care a lot about following God's word and making sure that they're following it and their children and their youth group kids and everybody. We want to make sure that we follow God's law. Um, but what had happened in the church that I had gone to is I feel like it got very legalistic in the sense that while they were teaching us about God's love, they were teaching us a lot more about these are the rules. Um, mm -hmm. And I just grew up in an environment where it was, you know, you can't wear yoga pants you can't wear pajama pants in public you can't um wear spaghetti straps you can't do this and um it's like just all of these rules and they contradict each other and even as i grew up and i started to have conversations with people who grew up in different christian environments than i did and i'm like oh well my church taught there was absolutely no drinking no dancing no smoking no anything and you better not be hanging out with people who do and then i grew up and met other christians and they're like oh we like bring beers to church league softball like it's not a big thing everybody's responsible and i'm like oh well these people are also very devoted christians who love right. the lord and want to follow him out but they have very different rules than the ones that I grew up with, the ones that I thought like, this is what it says. And so that really led me on a journey of, okay, what does the Bible say? Because there's so many rules that we place on ourselves and rules themselves are not bad. God gives us rules. He gives us laws for our good, but we can get off track when we get so focused on, okay, we have to follow this rule and that rule. And we're making up all of these rules for ourselves. But God's like, I never replaced that on you. Um, for some people that's wise, but that's not a hard and fast rule for everyone. And we see that in the Bible as well with the Pharisees, like you mentioned a minute ago. Um, the Pharisees were very religious people. They cared a lot about God. They wanted to follow his rules. They had the Old Testament and was full of all these rules. And besides that, they took those rules and then they added on their own rules. And they said, okay, the Bible gives us this rule. So let's explain it and let's expand on it. And let's make all of these new rules. And you know, you better not do any of these things or you're a terrible, horrible Christian and God's gonna hate you. Um, and it just spirals. And I think that so often we see this same thing happening today and we don't realize it when we get on social media or when we have conversations with those around us and we say, oh, well, you believe that way. Well, obviously you're not a Christian. Oh, you voted for that guy. How could you? Obviously only Christians would do this. I don't know how you could possibly vote for this, or I don't know how you could possibly believe this or go there or do this how you could and still be a Christian. And if you take a step back, you're like, you know, this is the same thing that the Pharisees were doing in the first century when they put all of these rules that God didn't give us. Yes, God gave us some rules, but he didn't give us all of these rules. Um, and it was just such a burden that the Pharisees placed on people. And I see the same thing happening today when people place such a burden on people of, oh, it has to look this exact way. And, you know, sometimes there's wisdom in that and we should listen to each other. Um, there are times when it is wise to do things, even if the Bible doesn't say so. You're like, you know, that would probably be dumb. We shouldn't do that. Um, right. But so often we can get so caught up not in loving God and loving others and living out our faith, but get caught up in, OK, this is the rule. And I got to make sure that I toe the line and I do the thing. Yeah. And I love I think it's Luke 11. Don't quote me on that. But I think in Luke 11, Jesus talked about like. Hey, because the Pharisees were getting on to him. And he's like, hey, you got mad at John, you know, John the Baptist mm -hmm. for um, not eating the foods and not, you know, wearing, living in the desert, wearing all those things. And then you get on me, you say I'm a glutton because I am eating and drinking. And he's like, no, either way, you're not going to be happy. And I think that's what it is. Like if we have our specific rules, it's really hard because not everyone is going to follow that exactly. And Jesus himself was like, I'm never going to make you happy with whatever yeah. I do. John didn't make you happy. And I think so many times we were so busy looking at the rules that we're not looking at people's hearts. And Jesus was talking about like the fruit of their lives is going to show the type of life they're living, even if they're not following your rules. And I think so many times if we have grown up in church, um, I'm sure if we sat down and said, okay, we believe this, we believe this, there might be similar things, there might be different things, but they're taught as this is how things are done. And then those who maybe come to Christ later are like, what are you talking about? I can't wear spaghetti straps or all these. They're like so confused 
because they come in love with Jesus and then they start hearing all these things. And so I think it gets so focused on all these things as do's and the don't. So how do you take in your book readers through and through the workbook, which Diana said, um, she says, wow, I love workbooks to go with the book. So Diana's super excited about that. But how do you guide people down to like, okay, now we're, we're going to look and see what God's word says and let's walk through these things. So I just love for you to explain how you were able to do that. Yeah. So there is a process that is written in a book called Grasping God's Word. It's like a big, um, very academic college level textbook, but it's super, super readable. I can, cause I was asking myself the same question as I'm like, okay, how do I, like, I know this is a problem. I know this is something that people need. Like how in the world do I give this advice? So I found this book. I absolutely love it. Again, it's called Grasping God's Word. Um, and in this book, he walks readers through a process um and this is kind of the same process that i share as well which totally giving credit to him i did not come up with this um but basically his process is he talks about the difference between understanding the bible back then and understanding it now and the difference he refers to as in their town and in our town so the first thing that we want to do is go back and understand what did the original passage mean in their town so for example or um, to explain this a little bit better, when you read any of the Bible's teaching, you have to keep in mind that everything that was written in the Bible was written by a specific person to a specific person on a specific occasion. There is no letter from Paul to Brittany Ann in the United States. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's no letter to the church in the United States. There's no letter to Trisha Goyer. Like, it's not in there. Um, these were letters that were written to the church in Corinth or to the church in Rome. They were um, to the Corinthians. They were written to specific people who were dealing with very specific issues. So I was just listening. Um, I like to listen to the audio Bible. So I was listening to first Corinthians. I think I was in 12, 11 or 12. I listened to a couple, um, but I was listening to it just a little bit ago. And there were so many passages in there that I'm like, you know, we don't follow these today. Things like um, a woman must cover her head in prayer, but a man better not cover his head in prayer. Um, things like that. You know, some of those really obscure sounding verses in there. And you have to remember when Paul wrote these verses to the Corinthians, he wasn't writing to us today. We can absolutely learn from these, but we have to understand them in the context that he was written. So when he was writing to the Corinthians, there were things that were going on. There were um they had a political culture that may not be the same as the one we have today. There was a right. historical culture. Um, there were rules. There were things that that the way things were done. So there was a lot of verses in there about eating meats sacrificed to idols. Well, we don't really do that. That's not really an issue in our culture today. We're not like at Walmart saying, okay, where's the non-sacrificed uh, yeah. meat in this aisle? Like, yeah. we're not doing that. So they were specific people who were dealing with specific issues back then. So Paul wasn't writing the how-to comprehensive guide for all time, for all people everywhere. While we really absolutely benefit from his words today, we have to remember he was writing them to a specific people who were dealing with a specific issue. And when he said, hey, do things this way, there was a reason. Because in that culture, if you did it this way, it would be seen one way. And if you did it a different way, it would be seen this way. Um, that was super vague, but hopefully you understand what I mean. Yeah. Like it is in a culture. If you do something, maybe back then it would be offensive and today it would be totally normal. Um, so it's just understanding, okay, here is what he said to them, keeping in mind that there was a reason and there was context. So what we really need to start with is understanding more of that context, figuring out, doing a little bit of study and saying, okay, why did Paul say this to these people or whatever book of the Bible you're reading? Why did the author say this or write this? What was going on at the time? What was a, this a reaction to? Um, what is the context? What was happening politically? What was happening historically? What was the landscape what, like? What were their jobs like? And so understanding some of that, that additional detail, and then taking a step back and say, okay, what is the main idea here? Um, another example is there's a passage in there that talks about greet each other with a holy kiss. Now today, we do not go into churches and just go kiss everybody um, because the main idea of what he was saying wasn't actually because he wants you to just go kiss people. It was be warm, be hospitable. I was trying to imagine that in my church, like everyone just walking around. <laughs> I know. And especially like in... Um, the age now of COVID, can you even imagine like trying to go yeah. up and kiss everybody? Um, that yeah. would not be loving. Maybe back then in that culture, that would be the loving, wonderful thing to do in our culture. That's not going to fly. Um, so rather than just taking the words at face value, it says, oh, well, obviously it says everybody has to kiss everybody. It's like, no, what was he really saying? Well, he was really saying to be warm and hospitable, to greet them like family. 
So, okay, so once we understand it in their context to the best that we can, obviously we're never gonna know everything. I wish we could. Um, but once we kind of figure out what did it mean back then, what's the main idea that is what he's trying to convey. And then once we have the main idea or the biblical principle, we can look at that across the whole of scripture and say, okay, where else do we see this? Does this match up? Um, we wouldn't want to take one principle or main idea that contradicts the rest of scripture. Um, oftentimes scripture seems to contradict itself, but it's if you read it as a whole, um, there's a lot of nuance. So making sure you're not just taking one verse and saying, oh, well, yeah. this is what it says, um, but reading through the treasury of scripture and saying, okay, what, is, what else does the Bible say on this subject? And if there's times where it seems to disagree, okay, why, like, why would it be like, what's the context? What are we talking about here? Um, and once we get a really good main idea, then we can figure out, okay, how does that apply in our lives? So today, yeah. to give this example of kissing, you know, people at church, well, we probably wouldn't be kissing people at church. Um, but how can be, we be warm and hospitable? Um, we can be welcoming. We can, um, a church in my city has a um, a specific service that's like sensory friendly. And I happened to be visiting that. And I was mm. like, that is really awesome. This church cared enough about people who have different sensory processing disorders that they have a service specifically designed to be friendly for people like this. Um, and just different churches, like you can have people at the door greeting people, helping them figure out where to go, um, being warm and welcoming and friendly. The, and there's just so many ways that that can apply. And again, that's going back to following God's will. Um, I can't tell you how to be warm and friendly at church because it's going to be different. The way that the pastor is warm and friendly is going to be different than the way a young mom is warm and friendly. Um, but it's figuring out the Bible in context, figuring out the main idea and then say, okay, for me, for the person that I am, for the people who are around me, for the opportunities that I have, for the gifts and skills and abilities that I have, how can I be warm and welcoming and friendly right where I am? Um, so maybe for one person that's helping out in the nursery, Maybe another person, they're like, you do not want me in the nursery. I would be yeah. running the soundstage. Um, so it's, it's going to look different for every person. Um, the Bible is not a one size fits all formula where we say, okay, well, everyone has to do, you know, like God made us all different and unique and that's beautiful. And it's just taking his words back then, um, figuring out the main idea and then saying, okay, how can I be a part of that? How can I use my unique gifts and skills and abilities? How can I fit into this, um, into this beautiful diversity and help further the kingdom the way that God created me to do that? Yeah, I just love that so much. And then you're showing like, okay, let's look at this. And you're walking people through um, where they might, because it might seem like this is so overwhelming. Like all of a sudden, I don't know God's will. And I was just having this conversation with my 19 year old. She's like, I don't know. There's so much in there. How am I supposed to know? Now I'm like, guess what? We have this work in this workbook that we can go through and we can talk about how you can learn God's will. So you're talking about like taking them through and understanding all these different things. And then it's a step-by-step -step process um, as you're, as they're going through the book and as it's, they're going through the workbook and it's done in a very easy, approachable and personally applicable way. So each person, like what's written in my notebooks can be completely written different than what's written in your book and the next reader's workbook, because, you know, also the Holy Spirit is alive and active and speaking into our hearts. And so I love that it's not, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It doesn't have to be confusing, but step by step, we can, each of us, learn God's will for our unique lives. Yeah, I love that. That's really um, how Diana said a little bit ago that, yay, there's a workbook. I am absolutely a huge fan of workbooks. Also, um, my background is in elementary education. So that is what I do is I will write you worksheets and workbooks. Um, to make it <laughs> super, I can, I cannot help myself sometimes um, just to like, okay, here's the teaching, but like, let's get in and dive in. And how does this look for you? Like, how are you gifted? And what skills do you have? And what do you see all around you? Um, because you have different neighbors than I do. And you have... Um, I'm different children than I do. You have a different husband than I do. You have a different ministry than I do. God created us all different. Even if we are very similar in a lot of ways, um, God put us all in different circumstances with different personalities. Um, and I just think that's so beautiful and so fun that we don't have to fit into somebody else's mo mo mold. We don't have to fit into somebody else's mold. We don't have to go and be like them. We don't have to serve the yeah. way they serve or show up the way they serve. Um, if you're quiet, awesome. God needs people who are quiet. If you're loud, awesome. God needs people who are loud. Um, he created us all these different ways because we all work together and that's how work gets done. I love that. And you mentioned, you know, you're part of, or you have equipping godly women. Um, and I think just so much of what you've been doing there. And I 
I subscribe to your email, so I get them regularly. In my, and so, so much of what you've done there kind of has prepared you for this book, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think sometimes people get this misconception where they think, okay, well, I have to figure out what God wants for my life. So it's going to be this like one big thing that I have to go out and I have to figure out what it is. And I'm just going to wait. And then one day it's going to like be this lightning bolt, um, thunder and lightning in the clouds of, okay, here is a the thing. And I'm going to get the like step-by-step -step guide. Um, but for me and for so many people that I have talked to, like it really works that way. Um, instead, God is so gracious that he doesn't tell us, okay, here's the end goal. I mean, sometimes he mm. does, but often he doesn't say, here is the end goal. Now go figure out how to do it. Instead, most often God's like, okay, here's your next step. Yeah. There's one little thing I want you to do today. I never set out to grow equipping godly women into this ministry. Um, I have eight books now, which I know is like a sneeze compared to your very many books. I don't know how many you're up to. Um, I never set out <laughs> to write eight yeah. books. That was not part of the game plan. Um, I was a stay at home mom and I had babies and we had medical bills um, because our babies came a little faster than we planned. Uh, we didn't have health insurance. So I was like, I'm home. I have babies. They take naps. So I have a couple hours a day. I have a computer. I can sit and I can start writing. And that was all I knew at the time. Like there was no big long term plan. It was literally, man, these hospitals are expensive. If I can sit and I can write and I can make five dollars an hour because that's what I started at. Like if I can make five bucks an hour, like that is great. I am going to um, I'm going to dive in and I'm going to do this. That was all of my plan. I was like, I just want to pay down some of this debt because hospitals are expensive. Um, God didn't say like, hey, go do this thing. He was like, here, here is an opportunity right in front of you. But what I found is when I took the first step, then the next step open and then the next step and then the next step. And I've just been walking like, oh, here's an opportunity. Oh, here's something I could try not with this big long-term goal in mind. It's just once I do the first thing, then I'm like, oh, here's something else. And doors two and three and four didn't open until I walked through door one. So I think yeah. that often people are like, oh, well, I don't know what the big thing is. Or, oh, all I see is this teeny tiny opportunity in front of me that feels so insignificant. Well, that's your opportunity. Like it's right there in front of you. God's not asking you on door one to like go do this huge thing. You have to work on your character first. You have to work on your obedience. He leads you gently um, step by step so that as you do it, yes, you're helping other people, but it's also helping you. It's giving you that experience. It's giving you um, that obedience and that trust and that faithfulness. Mm -hmm. um, it's developing your character as much as you're helping other people. So if you're like, okay, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't have this big thing. Okay. What are the little things right in front of you? What are the opportunities where you're like, oh, I could probably do that, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, do you need to volunteer at your kid's school? Do you need to go write a note for your neighbor that you haven't seen in a while and just give them some encouragement or call up a friend that you haven't talked to in a while? Um, if it's a little thing, the little things are still really big things. Um, so I wouldn't sit around and say, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the big thing is. I'm just going to sit. It's like, no, what are the things you can do? What are the things right in front of you? And you just start walking and then God can guide you from there. Yeah. And I think we could either go one of two ways. Like we feel like, I feel like called like to write, like whether us mm -hmm. write books. And then we get so overwhelmed by thinking about what publisher am I going to pick mm -hmm. or whatever. And we're like, um, you need to actually sit down for 10 minutes and actually put something <laughs> on paper. Like we try to look too far mm -hmm. or like you said, we, we think the little steps are insignificant, but mm -hmm. later, and I think when we pray, one thing I always feels like if we say, God, who do you want me to reach out to today? Mm -hmm. Who can I serve? Who can I? He will always put something, someone on your mind, someone on your heart. And often it's taking those steps of obedience of just like you said, loving our neighbor, mm -hmm. writing a letter to one person. I remember I started the teen mom support group um, and it was like there was I we trained. There's 13 of us. Two teen moms worked in that first walked in that first day. And it, we would think that first day, like, we're a failure. Mm -hmm. I saw over the years, all these young women walked in and then I wrote a book for teen moms and that led my writing career. It's like God had this plan, but I had to be faithful to gather women together and us start praying and then us being willing to reach out to those two moms that showed up the first time, which actually one of those two moms that I'm super close to, I see her every day. She lives by me like, it's God had big plans. But we often, first of all, don't think the small steps are worthwhile or we get too like worried about what's down the road without taking those steps. So I love how, um, you know, you could help us 
through the book and through the workbook, just like it's a step-by-step -step thing. What is God asking you to do today? What, as you're reading the scripture, is he speaking to your heart? Did it apply to your life? Just like it applied to these people living in this time, how can it apply to you? And it is so amazing that when all of a sudden we're just doing those daily things, mm -hmm. pretty soon we said, we realized like we're, we are in the middle of God's will because mm -hmm. we're doing the daily things that he's asking us to do. Yeah, I think it's so easy to see people who have some degree of worldly success or platform or what have you. Um, like, oh, wow, she has so many books. Like, she must be this amazing, crazy person. I could never be like that. And um, as somebody who has a few books and you have a lot of books and talks to people who have books or whatever it is, um, all of us would tell you, I'm sure, none of us were like, oh, I am going to be this famous person. I'm just going to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay, like maybe I could kind of write something like maybe that, like maybe that yeah. would work out. So I'm going to sit down and it really, um, on videos like this, it's so fun. And I would have makeup on and like a cute shirt that my husband bought me. Um, yeah. <laughs> he bought me the shirt. I'm like, this is really cute. I like, I, this it is really cute. I like it. <laughs> um, but most days it really is sitting down with your butt in the chair, um, looking like a hot mess with kids running everywhere. And you're like, yeah. okay, I have to sit, I have to write. Um, and you spend years and the first days that you sit down to write were the first time that you have a ministry the first, whatever you do, you show up small. And that's how you mm -hmm. start because you learn and that's such a gift and that's such a blessing because when you're first starting out, you don't know what you're doing yet. None of us know yeah. what we're doing yet. Um, my kids will come to me sometimes and they will be like, oh, I'm not any good at this. And I'm like, okay, well, how many times have you practiced this? And they're like, oh, well, it was my first time. I'm like, well, it's your first time. You're not supposed yeah. to be good at this. Um, if it's your first time playing baseball, if it's your first time drawing a picture, uh, you're not supposed to be good at this. And that mm -hmm. is just, um, I think, such a blessing that we get to start small. We get to figure out what we're doing. We get to be really bad at it for a really long time. Um, we get to make a lot of mistakes while we're still small, while nobody is paying attention, while nobody sees it but your mom. And that's really good. And she can be like, that's really great. But maybe like do some things about that part. Um, but we get to make those mistakes small, but most of whether that's writing or ministry or whatever it is that God has called you to, uh, most of it is not glitz and glamour. It is sit, yeah. sitting down and saying, okay, I believe that God has called me to do this thing, or I believe that God has gifted me in this way, or, you know, this is something I can do to pay down some debt. So this is what we're going to try. Um, and it's just sitting down and saying, okay, I don't have it figured out. It's going to be terrible the first 2000 times that I do it at least, but I'm going to sit down every day. I'm going to look like a hot mess. My house is going to be a hot mess. The kids are going to need things, um, but I'm going to sit down and I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to sit and I'm going to write, or I'm going to sit and I'm going to start a YouTube channel, or I'm going to be a ministry um, person at my church, whatever it is, I'm going to sit and I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to be faithful with whatever God has given me. Um, and if he decides to bless us with a lot, awesome. Praise be to God. If he decides that we are meant to just really pour into a small community, awesome. Praise be to God. Because both of those are so incredibly valuable. Um, I had a conversation with um, several authors recently. A, a group of us authors got together and we went around the table and each of us were asked to share, okay, who is somebody in your life who has had the greatest impact? You can't say your mom because everybody would say their mom. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can't say your mom and you can't say Jesus. But other than them, who is somebody who has had the biggest impact in your life? And let me tell you, as we went around this table of probably 10 to 15 women, not a single person said an author not a single right. person said I'm some like person who's involved in um, a big ministry or like a celebrity or a movie star or any of these like big flashy roles, not a single person. Every single person was like, you know, it was my teacher who, when I was going through a really rough time, they really encouraged me. Or, you know, it was my coach or it was my youth pastor, or it was this woman at my church. It was somebody that I knew and it wasn't this big flashy thing. It was they were faithful right where they were. And they loved on me when I needed somebody to love on me. And they saw me. And that is just such a beautiful ministry. So I don't want to discount any kind of ministry, whether God has called you to huge things or whether God has called you to the ministry of the everyday. It is all so important. It's all essential. We need all of it to make the world go round. That is so good. And when you said that, I was thinking of my Sunday school teacher that was like fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And there was like, two or three kids every week mm -hmm. in our little country church. And she was there every week and we memorized scripture verses. She brought a little prize box. So we got prizes. 
Um, you know, she would take us out when we learned so many scriptures, we'd go out to dinner with her, which mm -hmm. was super fun. She'd have a group of us girls staying the night at our house. And I'm thinking, and her name's Margo. She's mm -hmm. my Facebook friend now, but that, that teacher that showed up every week for two or three girls or, you know, mm -hmm. that were there, um, just really just impacted what a faithful woman of God, you know, was. And when I was struggling as a teenager, I thought like, mm -hmm. God still loves me. And I thought back to all the lessons she taught me. And it really does just those everyday moments when we sit down and I'm sure God spoke to her heart and said, go sit down when, and you know, you're going to teach Sunday school, the fourth, fifth and sixth graders. And she probably could have been upstairs and been doing different things. And, but she served in that way. And so I love that God's will, whether we see it as big or small, he sees obedience to him is always big in his mm -hmm. eyes. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's oftentimes one of the hardest parts is just being obedient because we don't see the whole picture. We don't see everything that's going to happen. We don't see where our yes leads. Um, when I sat down to write some medical articles, uh, it was medical articles, by the way, um, they were like $5 an hour. It was terrible. I wrote so many articles about dental implants and I'm like, you know, this is like, I don't know any, like in car dealerships. I'm like, I don't know anything about any of this. It was literally just Google it and like write something. Um, yeah. I definitely didn't start this thinking, oh, I'm going to be an author someday. I was like, this is something that I can do. Um, I know my commas well enough. I can get started here. And so I think sometimes we just miss the boat because we're like, oh, well, we think it has to be this way. It has to be something that has to do with ministry or it has to be um something big or maybe people in our lives have told us like oh you can't be this um, i know that there's a lot of debate that goes on around you need to be a working mom or you need to be a stay-at-home mom and depending on which part of the country in your family um maybe you've been told like only this one is valuable or only this one is valuable or maybe you've been told like women have to be quiet and submissive or oh i wish i was more charismatic like that woman she's so outgoing um but it takes all kinds um, I feel like I've yeah. said this a few times now, but I'm like, it just, it takes all kinds. And so I don't want women to miss out. And that's why I have the workbook as well, just so that you can walk through and be like, okay, how has God uniquely gifted me? What are the opportunities yeah. that are right in front of me? And it doesn't have to look the way that my sister-in-law does it. It doesn't have to look the way that my women's ministry leader at my church does it or the way that my mom did it. If God has placed something on your heart, if God has given you skills and abilities, he gave you those for a reason. If there's, even if it's your interests and desires. Um, so often we think, oh, well, God calls us. He's going to call us to be a missionary to go to Africa. Well, if you have never had any desire to go to Africa, you've never yeah. like, you have no interest or ability in that area. God's probably not going to call you there. Um, but if God wants you to be a painter, he's going to make you creative and curious mm -hmm. and artistic. So some of the things that we think are nothing um, and that's such a shame too, because so often as women, we're like, oh, I don't have any gifts. I'm not good at yeah. anything. Um, I think it is a responsibility of ours to figure out what are you good at? Because we all have gifts. God has called each of us. He's given each of us a purpose and a mission. Every single person, um, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.12 that we were God, that we are God's handiwork created yeah. in Christ Jesus for um what he decided before the beginning of the world that we would do. Um, and so you are created for a purpose. You are here for a reason. You are exactly where you are because God placed you there. And he gave you the personality that he gave you for a reason. If he wants you to do this kind of role, he's going to give you the personality and the gifts and the skills. He's going to um, put you in situations that are going to help shape your character, that are going to give you skills. And so many of the things ahead of time, we might be like, oh, that was just something I did, like not a big deal. Um, but it's so fun, I think, when we go through all of these experiences and then years down the road and we look back and we're like, oh, I thought that that was just like some fun thing that I did. I thought that was just like a hobby or I thought that was just yeah. something that I just randomly did. And then you look back and you're like, no, actually, God has guided me every single step of the way with all of these things that feel really random. But when you put them together, it absolutely led me to exactly where I am today, which I knew. God knew the whole time, even when we had no idea, when we didn't see the path forward. Um, so it really goes back to trusting that God is good. He knows what he's doing. He created you on purpose. He didn't create you to be like anyone else. He created you to be you. Um, because he has something for you that's unique to you, um, something that he needs you to do. And it doesn't have to be this thing where we're like, oh, God wants me to go be a missionary. It's like, no, he gives you <laughs> skills and abilities. Um, God doesn't want us to be miserable. He doesn't be like, hey, here's your set of rules. Good luck. Have fun. Um, 
God wants us to find joy in him. And yes, sometimes yeah. it's scary. And yes, sometimes it's hard. And yes, sometimes it's just sitting down and I'm like, okay, I get to write another page and woohoo. Like I wish I wasn't doing this right now. Um, but God wants us to have joy in him. And once you start diving in and once you start obeying and once you get past, I don't know if you ever get quite past that fear, but you learn to walk in spite of the fear in yeah. spite of the doubt, because let me tell you, we all have fears. We all have doubts. We all show up every day. And like, I am not good enough to be doing this. Like, who am I? I'm like, nothing. I'm just going to show yeah. up and, you know, hear God. This is, um, this is what I have. Yeah. Like, it's not good enough. It's never going to be good enough, but you know, it doesn't have to be like, we can show up. I'm like the parable where with the little boy and the little fish and the little loaves and just be like, you know, this is yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's enough. not enough. It's not good. It's never going to be, I'm, if this isn't clear, I'm a total perfectionist. Um, <laughs> it's not ever going to be good enough. It's not ever going to be enough, but it doesn't need to be enough because the, the same Jesus mm -hmm. who took those little loaves and those little fish and he fed the 5,000 can take your little bit and make it more than enough. I love that so much. Jennifer said, loving this. Thank you so hard for me to get in the chair to sit and write and also work on building my YouTube channel just to see where God takes me. He has put it on my heart to do that just because it's fun. And it is okay. Mm -hmm. It's like he gives us, a desire in our hearts so he can grant the desire of our hearts. Um, and Diana said, my fifth grade teacher was a great mentor to all of us that year. She mm -hmm. taught us how to sing, how great thou art. And I went to a Christian um, school. And then Marcy says, these are such good comments. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just taking over some fresh cookies to the person who just moved in. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, I love it. And I just love how each of these people God is calling them to a specific thing and that is what his desire is for you and i think this book is going to be so helpful um if you're going to hold it up again because sure. i think the cover looks great too yep follow god's will um and also the, the work work yep. is yeah and what date is it released um october 4th which is tomorrow if you're watching this tomorrow, tomorrow. tomorrow. so you can get your pre-orders in and tomorrow they start shipping we're we're very excited over here very cool. It's perfect. Um, and then where, Brittany, can people go to find more information about you and the book and everything that you do? Like I said, I, I subscribe to your email newsletter mm -hmm. and I enjoy giving them. So where can they do all those things? Yes. My website is equippinggodlywomen.com. And if you go there, you can get all of the things. Um, my favorite thing is, as you mentioned, my email newsletter, um, two to three times a week, I am sending out encouragement, um, super practical tips and all kinds of resources. I love to curate like the best of what's going on um, in the Christian blogosphere. Um, so I'm always sending things out. That's my favorite. But also, if you are interested in this book, you're like, okay, follow God's will. Sounds interesting. I'm not sure. Maybe I want to learn more. Um, if you go to equippinggodlywomen.com, you can download and read the first chapter for free and check it out and decide if it is something that would be a good fit for you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was awesome talking to you. And um, I just know so many people are going to be blessed and encouraged. So thank you. Thank you. This is so fun.